What is going on, all you Pokemon Collectomaniacs out there? This is Ryan, the Pika Pika Papa, and it is time for our Twilight Masquerade set review. So on this channel, I like to do a review of all the new sets. I usually do one before they come out, and I always try and do one three months after they release. And this is a little bit longer than three months after Twilight Masquerade, but that's because the set has been doing all kinds of awesome stuff, so I wanted to try and give it a little bit more time to see what happened. Uh, and it's just continuing to perform really, really well. So guess what? The time is now uh, and we're going to be talking about it. Now the reality is I don't have a crystal ball. Nobody else has a crystal ball. None of us understand what exactly is going to happen uh, with Twilight Masquerade into the future but what we can do is we can take lessons from the past, apply them to the present to give us some scope of what might possibly happen further down the road and that's what we're going to be doing today. So I thought for Twilight Masquerade, which has obviously come out incredibly hot, it would be a cool exercise to do some comparisons to some of the other really cool sets from the Sword and Shield era, okay? And I don't have Evolving Skies on here because I think we can all agree Twilight Masquerade isn't the next Evolving Skies. Like, hopefully we get another set of that level or magnitude here in Scarlet and Violet, but at least I don't think Twilight Masquerade is it. But I did think it was cool to compare it to Lost Origin, Brilliant Stars, Fusion Strike, and Chilling Rain. So in the graphic down below, you'll see that I have the prices for all of those sets, including Twilight Masquerade. And as you know, in this channel, like I warehouse tons of data. So I have the booster box prices for all of those sets going back to the day that they launched, including up to, well, where they are right now. But in this graphic, we're going to look at from launch price all the way up to through four months. And I know Twilight Masquerade isn't quite to four months yet, but hey, the trend is already in the upward in the right direction. So we can guess that it's going to maintain its current trajectory. So I have the four month for Twilight Masquerade, even though we're a couple weeks prior to that. And one of the things we're going to talk about too is not just the booster box prices, but we're really going to do a deep dive into individual cards and look for some commonalities from some chase cards. And we're going to have a ton of fun on this video, I guarantee it. But when I was doing this, even though I have this data, right, like I don't have it all memorized, so it was really interesting for me to go back and see how some of these awesome sets from Sword and Shield started, especially Chilling Rain and Brilliant Stars. Like both of those sets came out of the gate really strong. I mean, think about the MSRP back then was like $145 for a booster box versus now it's $161. So when you see Chilling Rain and Brilliant Stars, both of them launched at about $130 for a booster box. That was not far off from MSRP. And you'll see that both of those through the first four months held onto those prices really well, really strong. And we're going to look at the individual cards in the set, and it's going to make a lot of sense when we do that exercise further into this video. However, on the other side of the coin, you have Fusion Strike, and Fusion Strike came out, and nobody liked that set whatsoever. You know, it came out at $107 a booster box, it immediately dropped to $90, and through the first four months, it held strong in that $90 range, which is, you know, when you think about that now, Fusion Strike is a top three set, at least as far as I'm concerned, from Sword and Shield. So that's a great example of how, hey, the set came out, not a lot of people loved it, but that doesn't necessarily mean that further down the road, it won't catch fire and get really, really hot. Lost Origin was somewhere in between. You know, it came out at $105 and then it worked its way up. The first two months were pretty low or relatively flat to where it came out. But then in month number three, it jumped to $118. Then month number four, it jumped almost to $130. So Lost Origin took a couple months to gain some steam. But that Tina in there, you know, it's got the Pikachus in there. It's got a really strong card lineup and it got fire and started growing. Then, of course, you see Twilight Masquerade and it came out at $103. And month one, it was relatively flat. But then month two, three, four is when it really started to pick up a lot of steam and that steam continues right now if you look at the booster box prices it's upward in the right and you know obviously it's got the Greninja in there it's got some really awesome cards uh, so I think it's gonna be a ton of fun to look at that throughout the course of this video now before I get into the meat and potatoes, I always have to say this. As you can tell, we are a data-driven channel. We do tons of deep dives like this. So if that gets you excited, if you get into this and you find value in it, hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Give us a thumbs up. And if you have questions or comments, drop them down below. we got a small channel here. Those three small things go a long way in helping me out. And I really appreciate it. So... Before we start looking at these four sets from Sword and Shield, I thought it would be really cool because TCG Player a couple weeks ago did some data around Evolving Skies pull rates. So I thought it'd be fun just to do that as a comparison because as I said, I don't think Twilight Masquerade is the next Evolving Skies, but I did think that this was some interesting stuff to compare it to, at least from the Moonbrion perspective, right? Because I did a I did a video not long ago where I compared the start of the Moonbrion card versus the start of this Greninja card, and uh, the Greninja card is blowing everything out of the water out of 
of the gate. So I thought this was a cool thing to kind of ground us a little bit. And as you'll see on the green box over there on the right in the upper left-hand corner, TCG player says, sorry, we're three years late. So this is uh, pull rate data directly from TCG player. And they talk about how hard of a pull the Moonbrion actually was. The odds of pulling that was one in about 2,000 packs. And then when you look at the Greninja from Twilight Masquerade, the odds of pulling that is about one in every 950 packs. So the odds of pulling the Greninja are twice as bad versus what they were in pulling the, um, or twice as better than it was versus pulling the Moonbrion. So it doesn't mean anything. Like that's just a, you know, that's just an interesting data point when it comes to this. The Moonbrion was twice as hard to pull as the Greninja EX, actually a little bit more than that. And then the other thing that I've been tracking here when we talk about the Greninjas, I've been talking about the gem rate. So obviously down here, you'll see in that graphic uh, that I have created, you will see that the gem rate for the Greninja and the gem rate for the Moonbrion actually, believe it or not, there's a pretty big difference here. So when you see the Moonbrion, there's almost 13,000 PSA 10s right now. There's been over 17,000 that have been sent in for grading. That has a 75% gem rate. And then the Greninja is at 65%. So the 10%, I mean, that's a big difference, right? When you're talking about 20,000 of these cards that will be sent through to get graded, you know, a 10% gem rate, that is a meaningful percentage difference uh, between the two. So, hey, listen, a little easier to pull, but a little wet, worse pull rate. It's going to be interesting to see where the overall population ends up. But as I say, all the time on this channel population is a very small fraction of what the price will be in the long run demand will always be the most important thing so you see the moon Brion, there's over 13 almost 13,000 in psa 10 holders right now but it's still going for about 1300 dollars uh, simply because the demand is so high and evolving skies is such an awesome set so that's the comparison there. Now we're going to forget about Evolving Skies, and we're going to talk about these other sets from the Sword and Shield era and kind of see where they stack up. So the first thing we have to do is ground ourselves in Twilight Masquerade, okay? Now, Twilight Masquerade has an incredible card lineup, and these are the top 20 cards right here. And the reason I'm focusing on the top 20 cards is because a little while ago, about a month ago at this point, we did a video, and as I said earlier, I warehouse all these booster box prices, right? We did a video where we looked at XY, Sword and Shield, Sun and Moon, and we looked at how their booster boxes have performed over the last three years because I do have all that information. And what we did was we assigned different variables to it. So we said, okay, the cards with the highest or the sets with the highest chase cards, right? Like how did they perform? The cards with the highest average top 20 card price, how did they perform versus the booster box? And we did all of these different scenarios. And then we put it through, you know, a correlation equation to figure out where the highest and lowest correlations were. And what was very interesting to me was how low the correlation was between booster booster box price gains and having a single high chase card. That was the biggest takeaway from that and the biggest surprise when we did that data dive. Now you got to remember like the jumping off point from three years ago, Sun and Moon, those booster box prices were already high. XY, you know, those bo booster boxes were really old. So the reality is the comparison to Sword and Shield in that video was the most relevant, but the results were the same. Still, there was not a lot of correlation between a single high uh, chase card and the booster box price movement. So that's why in this video, we're going to be looking at the top 20 singles cards from Twilight Masquerade and from those other four sets because I think that's the most relevant. And at least over the last three years, the data has proven that, hey, chase cards are super important, but they are far from the most important. The top 20 is the most important when it comes to a correlation between booster box price growth uh, and that being the leading indicator. So... Now that's out of the way, let's start talking about some of these sets. So I had to start off with Chilling Rain, and my gosh, just look at Chilling Rain. Chilling Rain is absolutely amazing. It is a stunning set. It doesn't have the biggest names in the whole Pokemon space up there, right? But it does have some incredible artwork. You got the Blaziken there at the very top. You got the Moltres up there. You got a Gold Snorlax, right? You got Zapdos in there. I mean, you have some big names in here, but outside of that, there's just some really great art. And that is one of the things that I thought was so incredibly awesome about Chilling Rain. And remember when we saw those booster boxes started off at a really high price point compared to some of its peers and it was able to maintain that. And Chilling Rain is still one of the top three most expensive booster boxes in Sword and Shield to this day. Now you'll see in the lower right hand corner, I kind of put these red X's over those gold uh, energy cards, not because I don't think they're awesome, but what I'm really trying to look at in this video is cards that feature Pokemon, is cards that have some kind of intangible to it, right? So if they're alt arts, if they're trainer galleries, whatever that is, obviously the gold Snorlax I included as well. So that's kind of what I'm looking at. And 
When we look at this from uh, Chilling Rain, 18 of these top 20 cards are really, I mean, they're just beautifully stunning cards, and that's why Chilling Rain has performed so well. The other thing that I thought was really interesting is Chilling Rain does have a pretty solid trainer lineup. Now, you got to take that with a grain of salt. I don't think that's going to have a whole lot of bearing far into the future, but when we look at all of these different sets, from the four Sword and Shield sets that we're going to look at, I do think Chilling Rain also has the strongest trainer lineup. Uh, I do think Twilight Masquerade has one of my favorite trainer, trainer lineups in a long time just in terms of its depth. I love that Iona card from Paldea Evolved, but I think Twilight Masquerade has a you know more breadth and more depth in terms of awesome trainer cards. Uh, but Chilling Rain did a really good job of that too. So Chilling Rain, I thought this was a really cool comparison to see how this compares to Twilight Masquerade here in a minute. Now, the next one right here, we're talking Fusion Strike. And when you think about Fusion Strike, I mean, it's interesting to me that all of us kind of slept on it in the very beginning. That Gengar card is absolute fire, right? I think that card is so incredibly awesome awesome. Fusion Strike was a massive set, so these were really hard to pull just because the sheer number of cards that were in Fusion Strike to begin with, right? Then you got the Espeon um, alt art up there, and then you got Mew. You got three Mew cards coming after that. Mew's a big one. You got the Celebi card. I even like the Genesect card in there. But outside of that, you start to get a little fluffy, right? Like, I, I put those red X's over cards, and I'm not saying that they're not wonderful characters or wonderful Pokemon, but again, these are cards that don't really excite me too much. So outside of that, you know, you got a couple other alt arts up there. I don't think the rainbow cards are going to hold a ton of value long term, and I certainly don't think that those gold energy cards are going to drive a lot of people into the set. So I thought this was a really interesting comparison. I think it's super strong at the top. You know, when you think about Fusion Strike, I think those first five cards, or at least those top four cards, are really, really strong. And then we have a little bit of a drop off there and then I think a significant drop off after, after that. So I thought this would be cool to compare to Twilight Masquerade. And then here we are with Brilliant Stars and Brilliant Stars when you sit back and look at it, remember Brilliant Stars as we saw from a booster box perspective started off incredibly strong and it makes a ton of sense, right? You've got trainer gallery cards in here. You've got that Charizard at the very top. I mean you have a Charizard set with all of these awesome, I mean that Sylveon VMAX trainer gallery card is absolutely fire. I like the V as well. I mean you got Mimikyu in here. You got some legendary birds on there. Arceus there at the very top. Umbreon is in here. Like it's just, the list goes on and on and on for all of these awesome cards that are here in Brilliant Stars. So of course I pulled Ultra Ball out. Again, I mean, it's a top five card for Brilliant Stars right now, but I just don't think a lot of people are going to be chasing the set to pull the Ultra Ball card. But the lineup here is really solid. And those other 19 cards, I think have a whole lot of excitement around them. And it might be flying under the radar a bit. One of the things that I thought was really interesting and I wanted to call out on this Brilliant Star set was the way that Charizard V alt art has performed at the very top. So here is a graph of that Charizard's price from the minute it came out all the way up to where it is today. So on February 25th, 2022, we were blessed with Brilliant Stars and that Charizard alt art came out at $170. Forget about that little bit of a graph to the left. Those are pre-sale prices, which were through the roof. It came out at $170. Now it immediately popped up to $215 and it held that price point for the next three months, all the way into May, right? And then it started to drop. And I mean, it dropped pretty much for about $70, or excuse me, $65 there over the next four months. And it finally hit bottom in middle of September in 2022. And then guess what it did? It popped right back up. And by the end of November, it was back up to a $200 card. After that brief blip at $200 again, then for the next year, it started working its way all the way down to a hundred dollar price point by the end of November 2023 uh, and then you can see that it's kind of been working its way up with some of the other alt art cards it's been working its way back down but as you see on the far right it's starting to get a strong price growth now I called this out just to show you a card with uh, a card coming from such an epic set, right? With such amazing art like this Charizard. It is going to go through these ups and downs and ups and downs. And just because it's an amazing card from an amazing set and the biggest name, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to have this huge price point, you know, for all of eternity. We've seen a lot of changes with this card over time. And I think the future, who knows what's going to be said in the long run in terms of price. But I thought this was a really cool comparison. Just the way it shot up, came down, shot up, and then really worked its way down for a long time. The next set we're going to talk about, and believe it or not, this is actually a set that is the one I'm considering, you know, the most familiar or the most, I don't know, that I would say is closest to Twilight Masquerade. Just my opinion, could be totally wrong on this, but for whatever reason, this is the one when I sat back and did my comparisons, I thought, you know, Lost Origin and Twilight Masquerade, I think have a lot in common. You've got the Tina card right there, which is a huge chase card from the Sword and Shield era. Absolutely stunning artwork. Like, I love that card so incredibly much. It's a little bit of a busy card, right? And I think 
think all of us would agree that the Greninja is a little bit of a busy card, but I will say that card also, out of all of the Sword and Shield alt arts, out of all the chase cards, this Giratina card has the worst gem rate out of all of them, coming in right at 50%. And we already talked about earlier how that Greninja had a gem rate of 65%. Again, you got to take that with a grain of salt, but... The other thing I really like about Lost Origin is you got the trainer galleries and you got some Pikachu cards in here, which are awesome. You know, when we look at the most graded cards, which is a good indication of popularity, you always got Charizard and Pikachu one and two. So obviously tons of interest in Pikachu cards. And then you got the Aerodactyl, which is a pretty solid number two card. I mean, it's not going to be the greatest card of all time, but that's still a hundred dollar alt art card coming from a really awesome set. You got a Pikachu, you got a Mew Gold card down there. But outside of that, you see a lot of red X's because I don't know, Boss's Order, like eh, not too much not a lot of people are going to be chasing that card then you got these gold cards on here again I don't think a lot of people are going to be chasing them you got the uh, Giratina variants in there I do like that Nessa trainer gallery card there so I think there's a lot of similarities and that was what led me to hear where I am talking about Twilight Masquerade so there's a lot of cool cards here in Twilight Masquerade but I don't know over the long run how these mass cards are going to be holding up in terms of value I know it's a big part in the Pokemon game itself and I know that there's this big belief that people who are big into the game now further years down the road when they come into collecting or when they want to collect more they're going to collect things that they remember from the game i'm not necessarily sure you know how true that's going to be but it's certainly a very interesting thought but still, you got some really strong trainers in here. I love that gear, or the Greninja right there at number one. I think the Eevee card has a really strong opportunity to end up being a very strong number two. And I've said this before, I think the uh, the artwork on that Blood Moon Ursaluna is really cool. I love Lana's Aid. I love the Carmine card up there. Uh, believe it or not, I like the Infernap. I think that's a really awesome piece of artwork there that is getting uh, kind of under the radar a bit right now. The Chansey too, I like that card. So I think there's a lot of interesting cards here. I think there's certainly enough of these cards with enough awesome artwork and enough oomph behind them to make Twilight Masquerade certainly one of the top four, top five car, uh, sets uh, in Scarlet and Violet but we still don't know what else is going to come out. I mean, who knows what the end of Scarlet and Violet is going to look like. Certainly Surging Sparks is going to be up there. I think Twilight Masquerade is going to be up there. But again, the whole point of this is just to look at some sets and some lineups from the past to give us some idea of what is going on in the present and maybe some indication as to what could happen in the future. So cool lineups, cool comparisons. I hope you enjoyed this. I had a ton of fun putting it together and looking at all these awesome Pokemon cards. Questions or comments, drop them down below. If you like what you see, give us a thumbs up. And as always, if you made it to the and you haven't hit the subscribe button yet we do fun stuff like this all the time and hit that subscribe button i hope you have an epic one i'll talk to you soon see you later everybody bye